Welcome back! This video today is dedicated to all of my fans. And to you folks as well. Specifically, we're looking at fan replacements for late 1980s vintage Macintosh computers like the Macintosh SE and SE30. We're looking at fans that can be purchased uh, on the internet, such as from Amazon, and we'll be comparing with the stock fans in terms of current consumption, airflow, and noise. So let's get started. In January 1984, Steve Jobs introduced the very first Macintosh to great fanfare. I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. The Macintosh 128K was unlike any personal computer that had come before, especially in terms of its industrial design, which Steve Jobs heavily contributed to. What we're looking at here is the vents all across the top, including vents inside the handle, showing how it is a convection-based design, whereby cool air would flow in and up from the bottom vents and out the top. Nowhere inside the machine do you find an oscillating fan, which was at the insistence of Steve Jobs. Now I'd like to show you the inside of a Mac that I own that has perhaps one of the best integrated fan solutions, although the most rare. Before I show that to you though, you can see some of the signatures here from the original Mac team, uh, including Apple Computer CEO Steve Jobs' signature right there. But uh, I want to direct your attention to the upper right corner. You can see this nice uh, fan here. Uh, just the same, you know, you've got the same vents you see on the left uh, as you have on the right, and that fan on the right there, it just sucks the hot air and it blows the hot air right outside those vents. You can't see it from the outside, and it's quieter because it's on the inside as well. It came with the GCC hyperdrive though, so you're not going to be able to find these fans uh, online, unfortunately, but I, I would say that if you can find a fan like this, it's just stuck on with Velcro. It's a pretty nice solution. It wasn't until 1987 when the introduction of the Macintosh SE that the Macs and the Compact series first came with a fan. As is mentioned here, uh, allegedly there were common component failures due to heat and the well-respected Larry Pina Macintosh Repair and Upgrades Secrets book also goes into that. Most of the problems with these early Macs were power supply problems and are traced to heat related failure. In my experience, I grew up in the Central Valley, 43 degrees Celsius, 112 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime, and my computer didn't fail. I didn't read a lot about stock computers failing. However, there were some that were upgraded, similar to this uh, Macintosh Plus with a 68030 upgrade. You had more RAM. The more you add to your computer, the more power it's going to draw, the more heat it's going to put off, and uh, the more problems associated with heat that you might have. Some of the solutions back in the day, as shown here on Apple Fritter, were the Kensington System Saver Mac, which, I mean, if you take a look at it, it's just horribly ugly, but you can still find them today. Here's eBay. We can see that some of them, uh, well, the prices really aren't too bad, and especially this one here, is, is some of them are in pretty immaculate condition. This one looks almost brand new, although pretty much all of them are used by now, and the particular way that you use these is you just put it on top of the Mac as shown here which really in my opinion isn't the most beautiful. Uh, the most beautiful in, in my personal opinion back in the day was the Fanny Mac by Beck Tech. This is the Mac World January 1986 issue that you can find on Archive Oregon. It's showing you you know how how it is without the fan with Fanny Mac and if you take a look at Fanny Mac I found a photo here on this Japanese site. I'm sorry I don't have one to, to actually show you, but it's it's more of a seamless design, whereas the System Saver, it sticks out and <laughs> just, it just looks crazy. This one, it's less noticeable. So I would say that uh, the easiest solution for most of you who have a 128K, 512K, 512K E or plus would be to use one of these external solutions. E either that or uh, a fan on the side. Uh, even Larry Pina in his book mentions that in the worst possible case, uh, you, if you cannot fit a little fan in there, that's just like my GCC hyperdrive fan and don't want to go through the trouble of it, you could put an oscillating fan to the side. And let's face it, you want to keep yourself cool too. So if the room in the summertime is sufficiently cool for yourself, it's probably going to be okay for your Mac. And if you're worried about it, you can just put a fan on it. 
But again, if you look online, I don't know where you can find one of the Bechtec Fanny Max. I've not, never actually seen them on eBay. But you can, if you really want one, you can get one of these system savers and that will uh, allow you to avoid any kind of hacks inside the machine. Okay, I'd like to bring the segment on the Macintosh 128K and 512K and all the way up to the Plus to a close. I didn't originally intend to focus so much on these machines when I first was contemplating this video simply because compared to the Macintosh SC and SC30, they're more challenging to add a fan to just because, well, Apple didn't have a fan in them originally. But uh, what I've said is true. You really don't have to worry that much. And let's be honest, folks, when we're dealing with vintage Mac computing, we're not going to run these machines like we did back in the 80s. We're not gonna, I mean, some of you might, but I would say you are, you're going to be a very rare few who are going to run this machine daily, maybe for eight hours a day, every single day. And I doubt that any of you are going to be running these as a server of any kind, especially if it's a floppy only system. So uh, I, I just, just don't think you have much to worry about. If you do have a 68020 or 030 upgrade or a, really a lot of RAM inside, some kind of board modification, then you might have to, well, seriously consider a fan. And, and again, I would say the easiest solution is one of the in-handle type legacy solutions that you can still find online. It may not look pretty, but it'll work and it's probably a lot easier for you than uh, to have an internal fan like my GCC hyperdrive and really for us to go in depth into an internal fan that should be a video dedicated uh, to these machines and I don't really want to take up more time in this video talking about them so uh, for for the meantime if you have one of these machines now that it's winter you don't really have to worry about it but in the summertime if you're worried run the air conditioner have a floor fan uh, you know, you're going to be hot too, right? You want to cool down. So if you have the room a uh, fairly cool temperature for yourself, then your Mac is going to be doing okay. Yeah, you'll feel the top and you'll say, oh, is it going to be okay? Really, to be honest with you, the only thing that might be an issue would be the electrolytic capacitors. If you really run your machine hot all the time, uh, it's going to cause them to dry out faster. It's not going to dry them out in a, in a week or a month or even a year. It'll take some time but uh, heat is the enemy of electrolytic capacitors. However, if you recap your board, then you've got a lot of life, even with that hotter machine, uh, out of those. And yes, I will make a recapping video about the power supply analog board um, in these machines at some point. <laughs> I'll be able to do that because I actually have new capacitors to do that. But for the sake of this video, I think what I've said is good enough. And now we can turn to the uh, focus of this video which is really on the SE and SE30 fans and how to swap those out which is really comparatively easy because all you have to do is just take out the old fan and then solder two wires so we're going to take a look at that now. Now I'm not going to explain in this video how to remove the back case basically you need a Torx T15 to remove the four Torx screws the Torx screws are the same as this lug nut screw down here, you need your screw driver to be about a foot long in order to get down into the neck. What I am going to show you though is this portion of the analog board which is pertaining to the fan here. The fan is a two wire device and you can see here that the wires that came with this Silinx fan were not long enough and so what I did is I just used the stock yellow and black wires especially because there was already hot glue there i didn't there was no need for me to rip that up or desolder this since these wires are still good and so you can see here that i just snipped them off removed the old fan and i soldered the silinx fan wires to the existing wires and uh, before i actually made the solder connection I of course slipped a little bit of heat shriek tubing down each wire then made the connection and soldered them and then I pushed up that heat shrink tubing and used a uh, heat gun you can use a hairdryer or uh, a flame and shrank the tubing over it don't use electrical tape because that'll come off over time I strongly suggest heat shrink tubing if you use the existing wiring here are two 60 millimeter boxer fans that are commonly found in Macintosh SE or SE30 analog boards. 
The one on the left is Elena brand, made in Japan, 55 milliamps current consumption when measured at 12.0 volts DC. Notice that it has five fan blades. On the right, we have a Sanyo branded fan, also made in Japan. This one draws a tad more current consumption, 70 milliamps at 12.0 volts DC, but also look at the number of fan blades. Whereas the one on the left has five, this has seven. And when I'm measuring outside the SE30 analog board, the Sanyo fan seems to move just a bit more air than the Elena fan. Practically speaking, it's obviously best to test these inside a Macintosh, but for the sake of comparing these two stock fans with each other, because they are slightly different frequencies in terms of the sound, uh, what I've done is I've put the fan on top of a soft surface. A hard surface will actually amplify the sound in an unusual way. So to prevent that and get the best audio recording for you, I put it on a soft surface and I have my benchtop power supply set to 12.5 volts, which is roughly the voltage you're going to expect. You might get 12.6, 12.7 out of your analog board, whether it be an SE or SE30. And for sake of comparison, here is our modern Noctua fan that you can buy on Amazon. To remove the analog board, I'll start by discharging the CRT with my minus screwdriver here and this wire connected to the lug nut. Now I need to remove the metal shield. And we can access our screws. CRT is discharged so we can safely remove this board so that way we have access to the cables in the back. Now remove the little black holders that hold on the white sheet on the solder side of this analog board and we do that quite simply with a flathead screwdriver pushed into these little guys and they pull right out. Now we remove the four fan screws. fan is free. We can remove the two screws here. It's now a matter of deciding what you want to do. Like I said, you can, if you're going to switch out this fan, you can clip them here if your new fan has short leads and just use these existing leads. Or you can desolder the existing leads, remove them and extend your leads. Um, also note that in the case of this stock Alina fan, the plus and minus red and black wires are twisted to reduce possible noise. However, I have another stock fan here that has wires, and as you can see, this, this is the stock hot glue still on them. These were not twisted, and Apple, well, whoever they hired to assemble it just made that decision at the time. So it's not necessarily critical that you need to twist them. But if you have enough wire length, I would suggest you do it like this. 
this would be optimal uh, as opposed to this. So since, since while I'm going to make this video, I'm swapping out fans, I am not going to clip the leads on this one. I'm going to desolder them here, completely remove this fan, and then so that you can see the airflow of this stock fan, I'm going to solder this one in. And here are the two solder points. Since I don't have separate flux, I always add a little bit of solder, which has flux in it, to make them these two points easier to desolder. And since they're just wires, I'm pulling them from the back side. And they pulled right out. Obviously, I need to remove the solder balls. And so, with the wires removed, I will do that now with my wick. I should add that if you frequently swap out your analog board or if you've recapped it and still have problems, it could be due to cracked solder joints on the back of these four connectors. You should resolder all of these joints on the back and if you frequently uh, do swaps or otherwise disconnect these connection points, I would recommend putting hot glue around each of these connectors. Don't put too much hot glue down here because this is where the power supply goes for this one, but you can put it up and around. And that's going to take stress off of the pins and put a little bit more of it on the hot glue because when you're pulling off the connectors, sometimes you're gonna wiggle them a little bit and that's gonna wiggle the pins and ultimately break the solder joints. Putting the wires in of the replacement fan is easy because it says quite clearly, fan positive is here. We know that black Right, it corresponds to black, so that's how you put them in. And you can see I've got the tips of the wires coming through the hole. Now don't be alarmed if the wires come out at the top like this. Again, this is a stock fan. Uh, this was obviously best if the wires come out at the bottom like this Elena fan did, but uh, that is just the way that this fan is set up. You need to make sure that the arrows, there are actually arrows on each fan and you want to make sure that they're pointing in the right direction. So here's the Elena fan that I removed. The arrow is pointing up and there's a little arrow below it pointing this way, which is the airflow will go out this way. And on this fan, you can see the arrows up here, same direction for both arrows. So that's really critical. You want the air to flow out, not in. So this is how it will mount. You can now put the sheet back on. You just have to pull out on them a little bit before you stick them back in. So the trick to get getting this back on is just to make sure that your little brightness knob goes in first and it has to partly go through this hole here. Make sure the bottom of the board is in, inside, put in, into these two hooks down here. And then you need to make sure that these plastic hooks here and here are retaining the circuit board. And then you need to feel under for the brightness knob, make sure that it's moving. And before screwing it together, I would strongly recommend putting in some of these wires first, starting with the power supply connector, which is way back here, and it's a lot easier to do with the board still unscrewed since you have some leeway to move him around. And you've got the power for the motherboard that goes here. Just make sure you don't squash your fan wires.
So be sure to put in your this little metal shield first. And keep in mind that the, the screws for the circuit board mounting are different than the screws for the power supply. The screws for the circuit board mounting are a little bit more you can you can tell if you put them together uh, th how different they are. The um, little grooves in the screws that go into the power supply are, are more straight when you look at it from the side and these are at a little bit more of an angle. Put our anode cap, uh, little cap back on here. So you need to put one of the hooks in first, and then we're going to push the other one in. By the way, I should mention, don't ever clean off this red goo. That's there for a reason. If you clean it off, you'll have trouble potentially. So don't, don't clean it off. You can clean around it, but don't clean off the red red goo. Now we can just put the case back on and test. Here we have the test set up. I've got these two boxes set to be about ear level height. You can see my iPhone 7 is sitting on top of here and the iPhone has a microphone and is detecting the dB sound level, the ambient sound, and the mic is right here so it, it will go towards the Mac. And there's about 40 centimeters of distance between the edge of this box and the front of the Mac. And so, with your ear up here, sitting in a chair, that's what you would, about your ear level, what it would be. And normally the distance between your face and the Mac, I would, I would guesstimate, would be about uh, 40 centimeters, which I have set up here. Now here is the particular app. I'll provide more details for you, including a link in the description below, but basically I'm talking now, so it's about 60 dB if I stop talking. It's about 28 or 29 dB, the ambient noise level of this room. So it will allow us to uh, determine how loud these fans are. Now you'll also see, a little bit hard to see here, but there's a little A here. And that A is basically telling it's weighted towards the natural human hearing um, in terms of what frequencies are naturally uh, filtered. And there is a Z rating that, that would not be adjusted for human hearing and I tested that and I decided well A is best because this is going to basically show you how loud the fans are compared to each other and compared to a quiet room uh, in accordance with how your ear is going to hear those fans and then of course at the top you've got the actual frequency of me talking or whether it be the fan so uh, this will provide some useful information for us. Here on the back, what I'm going to do is install this little CFM meter. <laughs> this is for the people who um, can't afford one or don't have one. What I did is just cut a sheet of piece, piece of paper uh, two, two ways. Of course, I cut out this rectangle first, but I made two slits in it so I could have these ribbons sticking out. And then I put a piece of cellophane tape uh, at the top. And this width of this paper is the exact width of these vents and so uh, where these this where the tape is applied is where the slits stop and I'm going to put that edge just right here at the top and we can see it's perfectly flat here and the papers don't quite come all the way down to this black power switch area but as you can see before they do come down several centimeters below the actual slit so the fan will need a fairly good amount of air to blow out in order to pick up these pieces of paper. And you can see they're only barely moving because this is the slowest RPM fan that I have and it really doesn't move much air. It is very very quiet and I'll go into more detail showing you this Silinx fan in a few moments, but 
This is just basically to show you relative to each other how much air is being pushed out and the way we're going to determine that is just by looking at it from the side and see how much how far out these pieces of paper are being moved in combination with the sound of my that my iPhone is detecting. I'm now going to test one of these stock fans. This is the Alina brand. You can see here that around the bolts, there is this blue glue here. I don't believe that's for detecting people who remove the screws before, but rather just to ensure that the screws don't come out. Even so, I have other fans that don't have this glue and I never had the screws come out. So I wouldn't worry about it if you're wondering if you need to use glue or not. But if you're really worried, you can, just like this. This is a test of the Silynx iXtrema Pro Series fans, which according to the specifications is rated at 20 milliamps at 12 volts, but in my testing it's more along the lines of 50 milliamps. Now it's time to test the Sanyo Ace 60 from Sanyo Denki. This is 12 volt fan, of course, 140 milliamps, so by far the highest cons current consumption, but it's also the highest RPM at 3,900 RPM. The specifications on Mauser considers it a low noise fan. Um, well, <laughs> you're going to see in a few minutes that it's anything but that, but by far it moves the most air. So let's take a look. Now here is the Noctua fan that most of you are most likely to buy since it's sold on Amazon and I really couldn't find anything much better in terms of specifications than this. This is model number NF-A6X25. Um, this particular fan comes in two versions. This is the PWM version and it also comes in an FLX version. I sent an email to Noctua since I couldn't find any information online that would answer my question and I asked them, I said, this PWM version fan, four wires, it's rated at 80 milliamps. But your other FLX fan, three wires, it's rated at 120 milliamps. Both of the fans are 3000 RPM. Seems like they're the same color, same fan blades and everything. What's the difference? And they told me, well, the motor is different. So I decided, well, at 3000 RPM, uh, the fan blades are the same. Unless the motor, the motor noise difference is just considerable, I don't know. I didn't buy both, both versions. I decided to go with the lower current consumption version because again, it's, it's going to go, it's going to drive that fan at 3000 RPMs just like the other. So I didn't see any need to buy the higher cons current consumption version. However, you need to be very careful because there are also 5 volt versions of these fans and you do not want to use the 5 volt versions. This is the 12 volt. Now, you are not going to use all four wires. And you can see here that I've actually cut off some pieces that were not needed. And actually there are a variety of things that 
come in the box. It comes with a variety of harnesses and it's kind of a waste, but we're not going to use them. There is no use for where we're going to connect because it's solder in two wires, right? And even these little, these little rubbery mounty silicon, I guess they're made of silicon, uh, they will not fit into the tiny holes. The holes are just too small uh, to use them. The wires you're going to use, black is ground, and the yellowish, orangish wire is 12 volts. The blue and, and green you're not going to use. So if I pull hard enough, this sheath will come out of this heat shrink tubing, and I can just pull it, pull it right off. I thought this was held on with glue, but actually it was just, just needed to be tugged harder so it was able to pull right off. Now I've thought of different ways to deal with these two wires and they're soldered on at this point but even if you have a very thin soldering iron chances are you're going to move your hand a little bit and you're going to melt some plastic. I don't want you to ruin your fan so I'm not going to recommend that. You might be able to wiggle and pull them off but in my experience when you do that sometimes there's a little hair strand wire that sticks out and I don't want that to happen to you either. It might cause a short. So, the easiest thing for the vast majority of you to do, in my opinion, would be to take your little cutters and cut these two blue and green, only the blue and green, unused wires off at different lengths. Make one short, the other one longer. And then I put a little cut off a little bit of uh, heat shrink tubing that can cover them up. And then for these two wires, uh, we can do a little braid or twist, twist them. So here's how it mounts and it also has arrows on it so it's showing you the airflow goes out this way the sticker side is on this side and I did not screw the screws down with all my might because there's these little rubber pieces and if you screw it in too tight you're kind of going to defeat the purpose of those rubber pieces so these screws are not loose but they're not screwed down with all my might either. I was actually able to make a tighter braid than I thought. So you still have, if you're going to run the wires like this. So you still have plenty of lead length. This yellow wire has to reach over here and the black wire here. Here are the two wires soldered in. You can decide if you want to hot glue them down or use a wire tie or just leave them like glad. I doubt that they're going to flop around too much. So you can decide how you would like to secure them. To help you better see the difference in cooling performance between the slowest Silinx fan and the fastest SANA 60 fan, I decided to run MacBench 3 all tests for one hour. So I quickly removed the motherboard and applied my temperature sensor to the main chip here. I get about 65 degrees Celsius. This is with a Silinx fan. And the reason I'm testing this particular board is because it produces the most heat of any accelerator that I have. So I thought it would be best to 
illustrate the amount of cooling. Now it cools down pretty quickly once you remove it, so I had to do the test pretty quickly, but as you can see, 65 degrees Celsius with the Silinx fan. Here we can see with the Sanyue 60 fan, the CPU is only 53 degrees this time, which is a considerable difference, much cooler than with the Silinx. And if you have a stock computer, that's probably not so much important, but you're probably watching this video to see how to better cool your computer anyway, if you have some kind of upgrades in it. So that's just with this accelerator. Imagine if you also have a PDS card, like a video card, that's even more important for you to have better cooling. So the higher RPM fans uh, are gonna produce more noise, but as you can see, are gonna produce a noticeable difference in cooling. If you're the owner of a late model Macintosh SC or SE30, what you've just seen is all you need to know. And technically, I could just end the video here. However, I know there's a good number of you out there who have an earlier model Macintosh SE, which has what they call a squirrel cage fan inside. Why they call it a squirrel cage fan instead of a hamster cage fan, I do not know. I mean, how many of you have pet squirrels, right? <laughs> Some of you might, but I think the vast majority of people who have small pets probably have a hamster as opposed to a squirrel. Anyway, if you do search for it online, you're not gonna find the name hamster. It's called a squirrel cage. It's a cylindrical cage. And I'm gonna show you some photos in a few moments that were very kindly taken by a fellow member of a Facebook group called the Vintage Apple Macintosh Enthusiasts. And I've never pronounced his name before, so Please forgive me if I get it wrong, but uh, special thanks to Damir Dizet Hafarov. According to Google, that's how this name of Russian origin should sort of be pronounced. Anyway, I apologize if I messed it up, but thank you, Damir, because you took the time to take these photos of your squirrel cage fan and uh, gave me permission to very kindly uh, use them on this video but uh, the photos are basically showing that it is a cylindrical fan. The reason why many people want to swap out these fans is because once they get a little dirty, they make a lot of noise. That doesn't affect the square 60 by 25 millimeter boxer fans in the same way. If those get dirty, you're not gonna slowly hear a noisier and noisier fan. Pretty much the, the noise level is going to remain unchanged, but with the squirrel cage fans, I, I don't have one, but I've read some first-hand reports that people have said this, when they are perfectly clean, apparently they don't make a lot of noise, at least not more than a regular 60 by 25 millimeter fan does. However, as you know, whenever you have something spinning that moves air, there's going to be debris, dust, particles, dust bunnies, whatever you want to call them, that are going to get stuck in the fan over time. And, and sometimes that can happen pretty fast. So uh, the reason why many people want to swap out the fans and the reason why Apple moved away from the squirrel cage fan originally was because it simply did not have uh, the staying power it needed, the resilience to dust and debris that was required uh, for, for a quiet operation and long-term use. And so most people want to swap out with a 60 by 20 millimeter fan. But there are some caveats that you need to be aware of, and that's what I'm going to discuss now. The first issue is on this particular analog board, as you can see, it has a metal mounting bracket. And for a squirrel cage fan, it doesn't, it, its bracket is built into the fan. So you will basically remove your squirrel cage fan and then you will not have a mounting bracket. And I have read reports where people, I've actually tried to use a wire tie here. I put in a wire tie and um, technically you can find some wire ties that will fit and I have my calipers here and I measured the width of this wire tie, it's 3.5 millimeters and the diameter of the actual holes, the bolt holes themselves are just a little bit over about 3.6, 3.7 millimeters wide. So this, this wire tie barely fits. But the thing about wire ties is, is that e even though there are uh, three, three holes, right? both top and bottom, once you string it through, it's going to uh, stick out a fair amount in the back. And I don't think that's desirable. Also, another caveat is, is that this mounting bracket is made of metal. This is the Apple Mac SE uh, 805-0936-A. 
part number bracket. This bracket, it's about a little bit less than two millimeters thick, a little bit less than that. And so the, the fan is raised up off the board by about that much. So if you use a wire tie, then you're probably gonna slam the fan right against it. I, I Probably that two millimeters doesn't matter much, but it is a difference that you're going to see. Some people use two-sided tape. I've read their stories. Uh, other people have um, found success in jerry-rigging a, a 60 by 25 millimeter fan in a variety of ways, but all of them have the same fundamental flaw. And that is, it, it, those fans, well, if you put them in that way, even if you can deal with um, the vibrations on whatever mounting system you choose, you're not gonna have these little, um, whatever, barn doors or whatever they're called. This metal fan has these protrusions that stick out and it guides the air out the vent hole in the back. And if you do not have the same bracket, then what that means is you're going to uh, potentially have some of that hot air that you want flowing out to flow back in. And so you see the problem there. There's also another problem that I found when I was looking on the uh, Apple service source um, set of manuals for the Macintosh SE. It says fan replacement caution. If you are replacing the fan with the newer axial round fan, which is 60 by 25 millimeter, which is what we have here, uh, make sure your, your customer system has the redesigned vertically mounted video board installed on the CRT, which is the CRT yoke board. You need the vertically mounted one. Now that's, all of my yoke boards are vertically mounted, but it's saying here that the axial fan does not allow adequate vibration clearance with the old horizontally mounted video board. So what this means is, is that if you have a squirrel cage fan, chances are you also have the horizontal shaped yoke board. And I don't have one of those yoke boards and I don't have a squirrel cage fan, so I, I don't know exactly what this is meaning here, but it is saying that um, the vibration clearance is a problem. So maybe that means if you retain your horizontal yoke board and it touches the fan, then uh, the fan might vibrate that. And if you don't want to have your video being jostled around or jiggled around, I mean, your video wouldn't be stable. So I can sort of gather what they're meaning here. And uh, so that's another thing. Even if you do have the appropriate bracket, if you found one, you bought one, made one, whatever, still, you, according to Apple, you definitely want to have the vertical, newer type yoke board. <laughs> So that would be another obstacle to overcome. But well, I will say this, I did not take measurements because I didn't want to delay this video any more than it already has been. But uh, leave a comment down below if you have experience with making 3D printed CAD designs. And if you have the desire to make a, a design freely available to everyone so they can download it. So far in February, 2020, I've not found anyone who has made such a CAD file, but I think the best solution, if we just ignore that yoke board problem for now, the best solution would be for people not to just look for a metal bracket because, you know, if you find one, chances are you're gonna find an analog board anyway, right? So these are hard to find. It'd be best to have a 3D printable plastic one. And if it could be made, I think it could be made even better because there, there are slight little gaps. These were manufacturing necessities of the original metal bracket that could be eliminated if the plastic if the plastic bracket could be designed in 3D and then 3D printed. And uh, potentially, because it's made of plastic instead of metal, there might be a little bit more sound damping benefit from the plastic bracket as well. Uh, who knows? But um, if some of you have that skill and are interested in doing that, then I can make measurements for you so that you could proceed theoretically. Uh, to make that mounting bracket and help out the countless hundreds or thousands, however many of you are out there, with a squirrel cage fan uh, so that you could potentially get that replaced. And as to the yoke board, well, uh, that's a solution. There's no easy solution to that other than just swapping out the yoke board to comply with uh, Apple's warning here. 
And uh, so that's what I can say about the squirrel cage fans. To close this video, I'd like to briefly mention two final compact Macs. The first is the black and white uh, Macintosh Classic Series, which includes the Classic 2 and Performa 200, and the Color Classic, which includes the Color Classic 2. Now, the reason I'm holding up uh, pictures instead of the actual machines for you is because I don't have the actual machines, but I've done the research for you so that I know uh, what fans you need to replace, and I can show you the locations of your stock fans to make it easier for you. So let's start with the black and white Macintosh Classic Series. Fan replacement in the Classic Series is fairly easy because of this service source guide. If we take a look at the fan section, we can see that it's telling us exactly where the cable location is in the computer itself. And really, the most difficult part is just disassembly. So, so long as you have the right Torx tool to open the computer, uh, it's really not that difficult once you follow this guide. And the fan, as you can see here, is different than the SE and SE30 series. SE and SE30 series, the fan is on the analog board itself, but on the classic series, it's not. So you're going to have to remove the appropriate components in order to access that fan. And once you do that, then it's a fairly simple matter of just removing two screws. And then you can see you would uh, splice your new fan, replacement fan wires, onto the existing wire harness here. And this is, thankfully, a 60 by 25 millimeter fan. So the Noctua fan that's available on, on Amazon, you can use the FLX if you want to, will work. And now we're going to end with the Color Classic series. In like banner, the Color Classic series is also fairly easy to uh, replace the fan, uh, also applies to the Color Classic 2, you simply need to remove the housing, and that's key. Now, this fan is a larger fan, and it's also located in a very unique location, whereas the Classic was located to the front right, uh, kind of where the motherboard would be on an SC30, and then the SC30 is on the analog board. On this computer, it's a part of the back case. Now, notice it has a metal frame around it. You can remove uh, the frame with a couple screws here, but you will need to access the connector that is shown. And if we look here, this is showing a picture of the back case where the fan is. And uh, again, there's two screws there, but you can also see there's the actual connector down here. And so you're going to need to snip off the existing wires and then splice the two wires, uh, red and black, of your replacement fan onto those two existing wires because uh, you're not going to run a wire from the back case. You're going to just connect it to this, this connector here. And the fan uh, that's going to be available to you is also an Octua brand. Uh, 80 millimeter by 25 is what you're going to need. So to recap, first of all, if you have a Macintosh 128K, 512K, 512KE, or Macintosh Plus, what you saw at the beginning of this video is true. You're probably not gonna run your Mac for eight hours a day every single day. And if you have it in the stock condition, honestly, you really don't have much to worry about. In the summertime, if you're in a very hot location, you wanna keep yourself cool too. So if you have a, ceiling, a floor fan, point the fan more towards the Mac, and it's probably going to be fine. Uh, if you have an air conditioner, obviously turn that on. And I really wouldn't worry about it. Now, the best thing you can do for those Macs in the stock condition is recap the analog power supply board. But to do that, I need to make my video on that topic first, and I've not yet done that. But that might be my next video. I'm actually considering that. So you can hold out and uh, watch my video on that for more information. That would really be the best thing you can do for your machine. However, if you do have upgrades, memory upgrades, maybe an accelerator, 68020, 68030 accelerator, some kind of daughter card, some of the earliest Macs like the Mac 512, they added a SCSI daughter card so you could add different things to those machines. And those cards will draw more power and generate more heat. And in that case, cooling is more of an issue. And probably the easiest solution for you is what I just described, System Saver Mac, Kensington. You can still find those in the auctions even now as of the making of this video in February 2020. And also, if you can find the Fanny Mac, that's even better because to my eyes, it looks better. But if you really have your computer tricked out and you don't want to have any kind of external solution, you want to have it internal, 
then this video doesn't cover all the details of that, but basically what I showed at the beginning of this video is true, something like the GCC hyperdrive fan, which is placed in the upper back corner right above the analog board is what you'd need. And you could use some kind of two-sided tape or um, uh, Velcro, which is really what's, what's used to, to hold on my GCC hyperdrive fan. You will need to run the wires and tap 12 volts, but um, that is really what you'd need to do if you're very concerned about heat inside your machine and you have a lot of upgrades and you want an internal solution. So that, then there's uh, recapping the SE, SE30, Classic, Classic 2, and Performa 200. The good news is the bulk of this, the testing shown in this video applies to you. The same 60 by 25 millimeter fan can be used in any of those machines. And my personal pick for you would be the Noctua. Uh, you can use the FLX or the PWM. I chose the PWM only because it has slightly less current consumption. I don't think you're going to notice really the heat difference uh, based upon the two because the current consumption is not too significant. So you could really use either one. If you've already got the FLX, use that. If you've got the PWM uh, version, use that. If you're deciding which one to buy, well, go with the PWM because that's the one I showed in this video. That's the one I have. Now, Noctua did say there are two different kinds of motors, but I don't really think they're going to be difference, a difference in noise because both run at 3000 RPM. So go with that fan. If you want absolutely a silent experience, then the Silinx fan is, is best because truly it is silent unless you put your ear right up to the fan. The only downside is it, you know, it's really only for a stock machine because it doesn't move much air. Uh, but you can still find them and uh, I think it's not going to harm your machine even if you have upgrades because my Silinx fan, I've had it for years <laughs> and my machines haven't been damaged by, by using that. So uh, yes, the Silinx fan is an option for you, but the Noctua, as you saw, it produces as much airflow as, as the Elena, the stock Elena fan, but yet at much, a much lower noise level. So really, I think that's the best for most of you. If you have an SE30 with a lot of PDS cards, you know, you've got that little splicer board, you can have an accelerator, you can have a MatCon Ethernet card, you've also got a spinning hard drive in there, a lot of things to generate heat. In that case, um, well, the San Ace 60, it's as loud as the Pico Ace 25, but it by far moves the most air. And um, yes, you could get fans that are like 4,500 RPM or 6,800 RPM, but honestly, the San Ace 60 is pretty noisy as it is, so I wouldn't want to get anything above the 3,900 RPMs of that San Ace 60 if I were you. Uh, now, I didn't cover this in my video, but yes, you could put an inline resistor uh, in, on either the black or the red wire of this NA60 to drop the RPM level down a little bit, probably something less than 100 ohms, uh, definitely a half watt uh, resistor. If you did that, and actually I did test that, I didn't show it in the video, but you, you can reduce the RPM level, but still produce the same amount of air as the Pico Ace 25, but yet at a lower noise level. Now that lower noise level will not be as low as the Noctua, but uh, you could still move quite a bit of air at uh, a little bit lower noise level by doing that. And then uh, to recap what we just said about the Color Classic uh, and the Color Classic 2, you need an 80 millimeter fan uh, for those. And again, all of these fans are linked in the text description below. So be sure to um, look through that. But I'd like to offer special thanks to those of you at the 68K MLA and also the Vintage Apple Macintosh Enthusiasts Facebook group. I engage many of you in discussion and asking questions about the machines that you own, which I don't, in order to help put this video together. So I appreciate your kind assistance, especially you, Demir, because you allowed me to use your photos. You shot those photos specifically for me. So thank you very much. Uh, for that. And uh, I'd also like to thank two people with a super special thanks, uh, two new contributors by PayPal to this channel in the month of January. Uh, the first is James Wiener. Be sure to check out the text description below because he has uh, a very interesting website. You can see uh, the link to that. It's called Hyper Talking. Be sure to check that out. 
And the second PayPal uh, distributor uh, c contributor is William Brown. I wish to thank you both. Your contribution will go directly towards making this channel better. And uh, as I said before, I've packed the text description with a lot of information, including, um, you, you saw at the very beginning of this video, I put a little uh, 10, 12 second clip of the original Macintosh 128K introduction in 1984. And I had actually emailed the individual who was the cameraman and actually shot that video. Uh, so you can see some information about him and a link to his blog where he talks about, uh, well, I'll let you read it, but it's very interesting. So you'll have to go to the text description to find that out. But uh, there's an interesting backstory that you're definitely going to read about that. And uh, there's other information such as the links that you're going to need for purchasing the actual fans. So uh, any purchases made through those links will uh, help contribute uh, in a positive way to this channel. Last but not least, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And I am guilty of this myself. Sometimes I've watched a video and I like it and I wanted to give it a thumbs up, but I was on my iPhone and I wasn't logged in. So if you're logged out, please log in <laughs> so you can give this video a thumbs up because your feedback lets me know I'm doing something right. Also, if you're not subscribed and you enjoy this channel, please subscribe. As I mentioned in my last video on anal analytics, the vast majority of people who watch my videos are not subscribed. So it would really be something that would help this channel and overjoy me personally, if you would uh, very kindly subscribe to this channel. Thank you to one and all for enduring this very, very long video. And I'm sorry it took me so long to kick it out, but I hope it's useful to you. So stay cool, keep your Macs cool, and thanks for watching.